Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm preaching the next two Sunday mornings, and so I was trying to think, well, what can I do that would kind of build on top of each other? And so I, uh, on Friday nights, we have a young adult service that, that we, uh, we put on here at the church every Friday night at 7 o'clock, and it's, it's a great time where we enjoy just uh, worshiping together and getting to the Word of God. And I've been preaching through the Sermon on the Mount for them and taking a look at one of Jesus' most well-known teachings in the Word of God. And uh, a few weeks back when I preached for Pastor, while he was having some problems with his back, I preached to you guys from Matthew chapter 5, and verses 17 through 22, I believe it was. And uh, so this is almost in some ways, I mean, we skipped a lot of verses, but it's in some ways a continuation of the thought that we shared there about Jesus and his relationship to the law. Here we are this morning in Matthew chapter 7, though, and so let's start reading the first six verses together, if you will. Follow along with me in your, in your Bible. The Bible says, Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will, excuse me, how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote in thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. As, as I've preached through the Sermon on the Mount and, and taken a look at the teachings of Jesus, and you go all the way back even to, the, the, if you remember the sermon that I preached about two months ago now, back in November, remember that Jesus is really taking a shot at, at the religious establishment of the day. If we back up even before he started his sermon to John chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible tells us that then Jesus began to preach and teach the kingdom of heaven, or preach and teach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There was a message that Jesus was specifically bringing to the people, and that was the message of the, the new kingdom that he was ushering in, the kingdom of heaven. Now, this was not a kingdom like what the children of Israel, the, the Jewish people, were expecting, right? They were expecting a very politicized come in and kick out the Romans, uh, get rid of that occupational uh, um, uh, situation that they were in with the Roman government. They were, they were looking at it with freedom and back to our rights and our way of life, how we wanted to live and and, and no more of these, these people that are, don't belong in our land being here. They looked at it as a very politicized thing when Jesus says, hey, my kingdom is coming. And so Jesus, in his first recorded sermon here in Matthew, uh, really takes a shot at, at that, that mindset and says, hey, let me redefine you what, for you what this kingdom I'm talking about is. Not redefine, really define for the first time. So he starts out with the Beatitudes, right? You guys know those passages. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the mourn. Those confusing passages where it's like all these bad things. And Jesus says, hey, you're lucky if you have these. And it's like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> um, and Jesus is saying, this is what the citizens of my kingdom, the subjects of my kingdom look like. These are the kind of people that, that are part of my kingdom. Okay, whoa, that just flipped it on its head right there. The people who go through pain and suffering and difficulty, Jesus says, those are the kinds of people that will be in his kingdom. Okay, that's kind of weird. The next thing Jesus does is he says, hey, we're going to take a look at the righteousness necessary to be a part of my kingdom. And he goes on to say, hey, I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets that you guys know so well. I came to fulfill them. I came to really double down on them, if you will. But there's more to that statement than just meets the eye. And, and Jesus says, hey, here's the reality. Unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the most religious people in your society, the scribes and the Pharisees, unless you have more righteousness than even they do, you can't be a part of this kingdom. Well, that's, I mean, everybody's out, right? It was a very well-known fact that you could not be more righteous in your actions, in your lifestyle than the scribes and the Pharisees. They literally defined what, quote, righteousness for that, for that era looked like, these people. So Jesus goes on in the next passage in Matthew chapter five, and this is one of my favorite parts of the sermon. Jesus has a series of statements where he starts out, he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, he says, hey, here's a law that you think you know and understand and are able to practice. Here's a rule, a practice, or a lifestyle choice that you think you get and that you've got under wraps. But I'm here to redefine it for you and show you what it really means. And the reality is, as Jesus starts tearing down this way of religion for these people that are listening to his sermon, he's really pointing out that, hey, you've been trying to live with an outward righteousness, 
that comes through your actions and what you can accomplish. And I'm telling you that I'm here to tear new, to give you an inward righteousness that you can never do, only I can. Because Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law. It all points to who I am and what I'm going to do. And so you must look to me to fulfill the law in you. And now we come to chapter seven and Jesus is really starting to bring the body of his sermon to a close. He's, he's talked about all kinds of things. He's talked about, hey, basically every single one of you are murderers. Every single one of you are adulterers. You're all hypocrites. You do things for your own good, not for God's. And now we're in chapter seven and Jesus says those famous words that we have all had said to us or said to someone else at some time. Hey, wait a second, judge not. Don't, don't you judge me. Judge not that ye be not judged. You see, Jesus is acknowledging that there is an inherent danger for us as sinful mankind. Demands of perfection can very often breed judgmentalism. You see, Jesus is pointing out, hey, I demand perfection. I demand a perfect righteousness, a righteousness that has no blemish, that has no spot, that truly meets not just the letter of the law, but the heart of the law. I, I demand this as being to be a part of our kingdom. And we all obviously acknowledge that the only way to meet that demand is through Jesus. And we cannot do it in ourselves. But the reality is that, that any demand for righteousness, for perfection, can and will and does breed judgmentalism. And I would submit to you this morning that a spirit of judgmentalism is perhaps one of the greatest scourges on the church, on Christianity, in every age that we've ever seen. You see, judgmentalism was not, is not just a problem that we face today because if we're being honest, we know that judgmentalism, that spirit, that mindset is alive and well. And we're going to talk about exactly where it is alive and well. But obviously, Jesus is pointing out that in their age, in their time, that judgmentalism existed very strongly. So we must ask this then in our passage that we're going to look at. What does Jesus teach about the dangers of a judgmental spirit? And what is the best way to live in light of that danger? So first, let's take a look at the, the danger and the cost of judgment, the danger and the cost of judgment. You see, when we have judgmentalism, we have a judgment, uh, judgmental spirit, that, 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 that mindset, that eye of judgment, if you will, there is a danger to that and there is a cost that we will pay. I mean, Jesus gets right to the point in verse number two. Verse number one, he says, judge not, why? That ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. You see, Jesus' demand here is for his disciples not to be judgmental or, or, or censorious, this idea of extremely critical, where we go around with that, with that magnifying glass, that microscope, looking, looking for what we can judge, what we can, what, we can, what we can point out in others. And here's the, the number one problem with that judgmental spirit, is that first we usurp the true judge. We, we put ourselves in somebody else's throne. That's what a usurper is, right? Somebody who kicks a, per, like a, a usurper politically would say it would be someone who comes in and, and kicks the rightful ruler out of his seat of power and takes it for himself. That's what a usurper is. And we do that ourselves when we have a spirit of judgmentalism. We say, God, I know you're the, the only true, righteous, just, and, and perfect judge, but get off of that judgment seat and I'm going to sit there instead. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We're going to jump over here real quick and take a look at this verse because it gives us a great insight to what Jesus is talking about. Paul really says some very similar things. Starting in verse number 10 with me, if you will. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block on an occasion to fall in his brother's way. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, hey, look, here's the reality of, the, of, of this truth that why are we judging each other when we will all stand before a much better judge someday. The judgment seat of Christ is coming where every single person gives an account for his life, for his actions. I, I don't need to be judging somebody else because I, I'm playing an imperfect version of a perfect God who exists. Turn with me, if you will, again to James chapter 4. 
James chapter 4 gives us some insight here as well as we look at his own letter and what he has to say about judgment. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says this, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, art not, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? You see, James points out that there's another inherent problem here. It's that when I pick up that gavel and say, no, I'm going to bring down the judgment, I'm saying, God, you did not set in place a perfect law that is able to handle judgment on its own. God, your word, your law, the, the precepts in which you desire for us to live, it needs me to come in and shore those up so that I can handle it. Not only does, that, does it do that, but it also takes a shot at the lawgiver himself. It says, God, I know that you're supposed to be this perfect and true lawgiver, but God, you need a little bit of help and I'm going to come and do that for you. That's what we're saying when we take up the mantle of judge, when we take up the, the seat of judge and, and pronounce judgment on our brothers, on our sisters in place of the true judge. You see, the disciple who takes it on himself, and there's a greater problem with this, the disciple who takes it on himself to be the judge of what another does usurps the place of God, as we read in Romans chapter 14, and therefore becomes answerable to him. You see, that's the greatest personal danger that we have. As Jesus points out here in Matthew chapter 7, when I pronounce judgment, that automatically means that same amount, if not greater judgment, is going to come back at me. And here's what I can absolutely promise you from years of experience of being an unjust judge. I cannot stand up even to my own judgment absolutely every single time when I have a judgmental heart or spirit towards a brother or sister in Christ. The truth of the matter is, is that I cannot stand up to that same judgment if that were to be turned on me. But that's exactly the judgment that is coming back to me is what Jesus says. You see, God is the only true, faithful, and just judge. So let's let him play that role. Let's let him fill that seat. Why? Because like we just pointed out, there is a reciprocal nature to this judgment. I'm going to jump to a couple different passages real quick for sake of time. In Romans chapter 2, we see Paul at the beginning of his letter to the Romans say something similar here. Another idea in verse number 1, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Hey, you're doing the same things you're judging others for. In my limited experience, admittedly, what I have noticed is that oftentimes when I find that people are being immensely critical of another person about one sin or another, it often later down the road comes to light that they were struggling with that exact same sin. I can be, if I'm being honest, I have done that exact same thing. There's just something about when I am struggling with a sin and I see somebody else do it, I don't know what it is. I don't want to make any statements beyond my own knowledge or understanding, but there's just something in it that causes us as human beings to be harsher towards the other person who's struggling with the exact same thing that we give ourselves immense grace for. James chapter 3, oh, I mean, Paul and James both have a lot to say about this idea of judgment. James chapter 3 has another statement that he makes. If I can remember where James is in my Bible, here we go. James chapter 3 and verse 1, he says this, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. This word masters is the idea of a, of a teacher. He says, hey, don't, don't strive to hold that position of teacher, right? Or that, that hold that position of authority within, within the church because he's not saying don't, don't teach others. He's saying be careful when you sit yourself down in that seat or put yourself in that position because there is a greater condemnation, a greater judgment, a greater scrupulation that's coming at you. People are going to be looking at you. God is going to be judging you. I look back at my own time as, as, as a pastor in this church and I realize, man, there was times that I didn't take that as seriously as I should have, that I didn't take the word of God and teaching it and preaching it as, as, as gravely as I should have. And I, and I stood up and I preached and I taught, I gave counsel from a place that wasn't in understanding and wasn't in truth. And I, and I look back and with, with regret at that saying, God, I wish, oh, I wish I would have handled that with, with a, a greater sincerity, a greater gravity, understanding the weight of those things. Naturally, a teacher is in a place of sorts as a judge. 
That's, that's what the rule is, to, to give information and to assess how that information is received and applied. And James here says, hey, wait a second, be careful about jumping into that kind of position. If we back up in James to, verse, to chapter 2, verse number 13, James says this, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Well, what is he saying? He's saying the same thing as that parable of Jesus. You remember about the steward who had come to his master and said, Master, I, I owe you a great debt, an incredible debt, and I, I cannot pay it. And the master, with mercy, forgave the steward of, of that great debt. That, that steward, that servant, turned around, though, to a fellow servant who owed him a much smaller debt and said, pay me what you owe me. And that other servant said, I cannot pay. And that first servant who had been forgiven the great debt of his master should have turned around and showed a great forgiveness to his fellow servant. But instead, he brought down the full force of judgment that the law gave to him and threw that other servant into jail. The, the master who had originally forgiven the servant turned around and said, what are you doing? I showed you mercy. Why didn't you show someone else the same mercy for much, much less? And Jesus does the same things with you and I. God has forgiven me a great debt. God has looked at me and pronounced what I owe of my sin as paid in full. He has wiped out the necessary payment through the, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. But how often am I that servant who goes and says to another person, hey, you've wronged me. Pay up. Even though I've been forgiven. See, that's the reciprocal nature of judgment. He who possesses, excuse me, he who poses as a judge cannot plead ignorance of the law, like we read in Romans 2, 1, and James 3, 1. And he who, in, who insists on justice for others is scarcely open to mercy himself. That's what D.A. Carson said about this idea of judgment. If we want to receive mercy, we absolutely have to display mercy. Because the harsher our judgment of others is, the harsher the judgment that we receive will be. But you know, here's the truth. As we read this passage, if, if you're at all decently versed in your Bible and what, what different pages of Scripture say, we kind of have to ask, is, is this a contradiction, right? Because if we go over to John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says in that passage, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgments, right? Jesus says, hey, do judge and judge righteously. So how is this not a contradiction? I mean, we can go throughout scripture and see, especially in Paul's writing or in John's other, other writings that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 3, 1 John chapter 4. These are all passages that have, have statements that say something to the effect of, hey, you ought to judge in these kinds of situations. So how do we, how do we handle this, this seeming contradiction? You see, here's the truth. The, the, the command to judge not is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be generous. It's not saying when we see that something that is wrong, especially that goes strictly against Scripture, it's not saying to turn a blind eye to that. Instead, it's saying to have a heart of generosity, saying, hey, I want to display mercy and look for restoration in these situations, look for healing and for forgiveness. You see, Jesus does not tell us to cease to be men by suspending our critical powers that, that distinguish us from the other creation, but, but instead to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. I mean, that's the truth of the matter, is it not? We want ourselves to be at the top of that totem pole, dishing out the judgment as we see fit. Because if we're being honest in our own minds, we really think that we've got, I, I really think that I've got this figured out better than everybody else. So really they should all come and ask me about what is and isn't right and wrong. But the truth that's even underneath of that admittal is that as long as we're the ones handing out the judgment, nobody comes back to look at the judge and to unveil what's going on underneath his own robes. You see, in other words, there is a difference between judgment and discernment. There's a difference, right? Jesus says, hey, wait a second. 
no, no, we don't want to have this, this spirit, this attitude, this, this, critical, this critical nature of judgment. But we do want to be discerning. And I know we're splitting words here and we're getting a little, a little bit pedantic, if you will. But let's take a look at what Jesus says here. See, there is a correct use of judgment. Look at verses three, with, starting in verse number three with me. And ye have, oh, that's not Matthew chapter seven. Verse number three, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, hey, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You see, it always starts with yourself. If we're going to say, if we're going to, if we're going to live under the guise of discernment of a righteous judgment, well, then it always starts with myself. It, it always begins, judgment always begins by looking in the mirror. You see, Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. Why are you concerned about your brothers when you haven't even figured out what's going on? He uses two words here to go back and forth. And they're a little confusing if you haven't looked them up about like, well, what are these referring to? He says, hey, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? This idea is like a speck of sawdust. It's like a little tiny thing that's in somebody else's eye, right? When you consider it's not the beam that is in thy own eye. He's making kind of a, almost a, 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 an extreme comparison to really make his point here. He's saying, hey, look, you're so concerned about that tiny speck of sawdust that's in your brother's eye when you've got a full-on log in yours, right? That's what he's getting at. You see, when we stop and consider our own problems, we realize that the little that I can see of my brother, because here's the truth. As I look at other people around me, Jesus told me very, very clearly what the truth about this is. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. You see, Jesus is saying, hey, you as mankind are very limited in your scope of understanding of the people around you. You can only see the external. And God, Jesus says, there is a limited facet of who, uh, of who you are that is available to me. You only have available to you the external appearance and actions, but I can actually see the truth of who somebody is. That is an actual uh, part of God's nature, the fact that he can see the inward parts of every man and woman who has ever walked this earth, and you and I can't. As a side note, when I claim the ability to know somebody's inward intentions, I'm claiming an attribute of God. I think that's something we ought to be very careful with in how we live our lives. Judging righteous judgments, I can judge according to the word of God, and, and I can say, hey, wait a second, there are actions that are going around that I can see in other people, but I can't see their hearts, so I'm going to stay away from that. Because God is going to deal with that. But what is Jesus saying? He said, hey, wait a second. Stop and judge yourself first. Because while you're so worried about this tiny little speck that's in your brother's eye, there's a great log that's in your own if you're being honest. You see, if we would stop and just consider our own hearts and our own lives, we would realize there is so much more wrong in my heart, wrong in my life that I need to take care of than this tiny speck that I'm overly concerned about of my, of my brother over here. You see, for Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He says, here's the, here's the solution. You don't like being judged? Then judge yourself. Judgment always realizes in humility, my own vision is impaired. I, I gave this illustration a couple Friday nights ago as I was preaching through this for the young adults. If you were about to go down, for, uh, go under for eye surgery, wouldn't you want the doctor who is going to be performing that surgery to have really good eyesight? I don't know how I would feel about going down for eye surgery. And I, right, before I go, right before I go under with the anesthesia, I look up and I got a doctor above me who's got those super thick glasses and his eyes are looking like cartoon eyes because of how big the glasses are magnifying. That would concern me. And I go, hey, hey, what's your vision? Is it 2020? No, not even close. Oh, well, wait a second. I don't want you operating on my eyes. I mean, let's take that even a step further. I, I would definitely not want a doctor who's, who's legally blind to be operating on me. But don't we put on the operator's gown and go to do that with our brothers when we're spiritually blind to our own sins and our own struggles? 
You see, Jesus says, judge yourself first. Consider David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 as the prophet Nathan came to him and he said, David, there's a man that is, there's this situation I want to tell you about. There's this man who, who has a lot of his own goods and his own sheep especially. And he's got flocks and flocks and flocks of sheep that he can go pull from. And he has this neighbor family who they only have one sheep. And this sheep is loved as if it's a, a part of the family, as if it's their own child. And this, this, this rich man, he has a friend that uh, unannounced comes and visits him. And instead of going to his own flock and getting a sheep from his own flocks, he goes to his neighbors, the neighbor family who only has that one sheep and, and takes that one sheep from them and slaughters it for dinner with his friend that comes to visit. He said, Nathan says to David, David, this is an injustice that has happened. And David is enraged. I mean, he's a shepherd, right? In his heart. And he, he loves sheep and he's just enraged that somebody would do this. And he says, we need to take care of this. Who is this man? And Nathan says, you are this man. David was so blind. He was so ready to go after the guy who had, who had taken a sheep that he didn't even realize that Nathan was pointing out, no, you took somebody's wife. This is the kind of thing that every single one of us deals with, but we don't want to admit about ourselves. You see, judgment always starts with ourselves. But then when it is time, it is then humbly presented to a brother. You see, let's read through this passage again, starting in verse number three of John, uh, Matthew 7. Why beholdest thou the, 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 mo- the speck of sawdust that's in thy brother's eye, but you don't consider the beam or the log that's in your own eye? Or, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, hey, let me pull out that little itty bitty speck out of thine eye, and behold, a, a beam, a log is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, verse five. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. He's saying, wait a second. When I have stopped and, and considered my own heart, my own, my own eyesight, if you will, spiritually, and realized, wait, I've got a lot to take care of here first. And I've done that and I've, I've begun the work on my own life. You know what? I'm gonna be a lot more gracious and merciful when I go to my brother to try to help them. When I go to my brother and say, hey, I, 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 I'm not going to go in guns a-blazing, man. I can't believe you don't see this about yourself. I can't believe you're allowing this gross sin to continue in your life. I mean, what a disgusting person you are that you would, you would have this attitude that you would walk around. You're, right now, I'm going to come in and say, hey, you know, I'm the last person to really be judging. And I'm not coming from a heart of judgment. I'm coming from a heart of love because I, I, I don't know if you realize this. But there's this thing that I'm seeing here. And I just, want, I just want to point it out. And if, if you're aware of it, great. I'd love to help share some things in my own life that, that have helped me as I've tried to approach the, the, the beam in my own eye. But I just, I just want to in love let you know, like, I'm seeing something. I'm seeing something here. I, I want to see that restoration, right? As we look at other passages of scripture around the idea of judgment, Jesus, Jesus always talks about Paul and Jesus who both give a, a great outline of what we sometimes refer to as church discipline. They both give this idea of, hey, the goal is restoration to get your brother back and walking on that spiritual path again. That's humility. But judgment says, no, I'm gonna let them know what's, what the truth is. You see, Galatians chapter six, verse one says this, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, that idea of power under control, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What's Paul saying here? He's saying, wait a second. The goal is restoration when you see something like this. Why? Because the reality is that there's temptation coming for you too. So let's approach it with meekness. Not self-righteousness, but meekness. You see, when a brother in a meek and a self-judging spirit as we see in 1 Corinthians 11, Galatians 6, removes the log in his own eye, he still has the responsibility of helping his brother remove the speck. Jesus teaches us that in Matthew chapter 18. So how do we apply this? If we are going to judge according to Jesus' teaching, we must be prepared to go to a brother in person and help them. Here's, here's a practical application of this within our own churches, though, right? It's very easy and tempting 
for me to go and have a conversation with somebody else about a brother's speck. I want to go and say, hey, did you, you know, so-and-so over here, I mean, they're struggling. I think I used you at Young Adults, right? Didn't I, Kai? Um, I think Kai and I were picking on Aaron. And we said, Kai, do you know that Aaron's really struggling with this sin? Like, I can't believe it. You know, we should probably do something. No, that's not what, I've not gone to Aaron. I've not gone to, Kai hasn't gone to Aaron. Aaron doesn't have a sin. That's what I'm aware of. Please don't misunderstand me. <laughs> the idea here is that I'm, I'm going to Kai and Jesus says, wait, no, 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 go to your brother. Go to Aaron. <laughs> go directly to him and have that conversation. Can I, can I give you just another side little note here? Same thing applies to the internet. We like to get on the internet and look at people all over the place and we don't know what's actually going on there. I mean, how are we still, you know, how many decades, a decade and a half at least into social media and we still aren't aware that it's all fake, right? <laughs> we still think that that's truly who they are and we want to judge that. Maybe let's be more concerned about growth together in spirituality as a church rather than judgment of each other within our church and especially judgment of those outside of our church. Maybe that would transform Christianity today as we know it. Maybe that would change and help us actually see revival. If in love, after working out our own sin and our own pride, we went in love and helped our brothers face to face directly. It'd be revolutionary. Absolutely revolutionary. But Jesus doesn't stop here. There's one other truth that we read about in the beginning in verse number six here. That Jesus is going to give us a contrasting idea. You see, he does come very strongly about this idea of judgment. It says, hey, judge not that ye be not judged. Hey, don't, don't, don't be messing around with this judgment thing. You better handle this carefully. But he does come back and he says, hey, there's a contrasting danger here to judgment. It's the danger of being undiscerning. Of being undiscerning. Look at six. It says this, give not that which is holy Unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You see, Carson said it this way, disciples are exhorted to love their enemies and not to judge. But as they receive this exhortation, they might fall and fail to consider the subtleties of the argument and become an undiscerning simpleton. This verse guards against this possibility. See, Jesus here is saying, hey, we don't become undiscerning. That's not the point of a lack of judgment. That's not the point of, uh, of keeping our judgment and letting God be the judge. That's not the idea that he's going for here. The first thing as I look at this verse, is it, it's a little confusing. It, it has a very poetic nature. And if you've studied the, the, the poetic structure of, of the Bible, you'll know some things about that. It, it, have you ever wondered, how is Psalm supposed to be poetry? Like that doesn't rhyme at all, right? Same thing here. The, the Hebrew poetry was a little bit different. Jesus lays it out this way. He says, hey, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. And look at the last phrase. Lest they, because uh, and, and, they will turn again and rend you. The dogs are connected to that last phrase. Then he has the middle phrase. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet. So we have two things here that he's using as his illustration. We have these dogs. Now, these are not house dogs, domesticated dogs. The dogs that, they, that Jesus is referring to are very much wild and dangerous. These were things that were used to describe people that they saw as such, people who were very destructive in their nature. They were referred to as a dog. It was a derogatory term. So Jesus isn't talking about, oh, little Fido sitting on the floor there, just so calm and, and friendly. No, he's talking about a ravenous animal who will, who will not stop to consider before he destroys something. So we have the dogs that are going to turn again and rend you. And we have the swine, the unholy animal, the pigs, right? Who are going to just trample the beauty of those pearls under their feet in the mud, in the muck. We have a similar statement here uh, to this, or not similar, almost the exact same statement in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Peter says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You see, these two animals serve together as a picture of what is vicious, unclean, and abominable. So then we ask our question then. Jesus says, hey, don't, don't give the holy thing to the dogs, to the swine. Well, what is this holy thing? As I, as I look, I think, I think you could give a couple of potentially um, good answers here based on Jesus' teaching. 
I think you could say, hey, my teaching about, about what the kingdom lifestyle looks like, these kingdom principles, don't, don't just waste your time giving that to those who are going to reject it and you know that. But I think that you could even take that a step further because everything that Jesus is teaching about has to do with the kingdom of heaven. This, this, this good news, this gospel that Jesus is bringing into these people. And I think what Jesus is saying here is mark those who are not handling the truth of the gospel as they should. Those who would outright reject it, those who would trample it under feet and try to destroy it. I think we can clearly stay based on the context of everything that's going on in this sermon that Jesus is referring to the Pharisees, the scribes, those who are viciously battling against him to try to keep him and his message away from the people. He's saying, hey, wait a second, this gospel of the kingdom that changes the way we live, as the book of Matthew specifically announces, don't bother giving that to people who are just looking to destroy it. People who would rather live in religion under the guise of, of good truth than in the gospel. People who would rather lift themselves up as a wolf in sheep clothing, sheep's clothing rather than preaching a truth of the gospel. So then who are these dogs and these pigs? I would say that they're any person who is given a clear view of the gospel, but they don't just choose to reject it, but they choose to respond with a viciousness, with contempt. We know people like this, right? They're not just satisfied to say, no, I'm not interested in Christianity, but they want to go after it, to mock it. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, hey, wait a second. When we, when we are going to go with judgment. Hey, be careful about judgment. Have a desire to restore your brother. But absolutely, those who are rejecting the truths that I am teaching here, mark them for the judgment that they will receive of me. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give that which is holy to the dogs. So in summary, as we take a look at everything we've talked about this morning, Here's what I would say. We should be careful about our judgment, but discern and fight but discern and against and those who reject and fight the gospel. I want to find that balance. It is a difficult thing. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy as I try to sit here and figure out, wait a second, is this person an enemy of the gospel or are they just someone who's struggling to understand the truth? That's a hard question that I ask myself constantly as I deal with different situations in life and, and the different influences that I can allow into my own life, as I deal with people, I, I have to say, wait a second, before I try to help them, especially as a pastor, Caleb, have you looked in the mirror and dealt with your own sins, with your own inadequacies? But here's the truth. The truth of this is that this passage of scripture, this teaching of Jesus is absolutely for every single one of us in here today. Because every single one of us thinks that our judgment is justified. When we pronounce judgment, whether it be often or, or, or seldom, we always think it's justified, do we not? We always think that I've, well, I've got the inside scoop here and I know what needs to be judged. We think we're the exception. We, we all think that we're the ones that doesn't have a beam in our eye. We don't have that log there that's impeding our vision. Well, I, I see just fine. I've got no problems that I need to take care of. It's all of them over there. And how scary it would be to realize that we don't even see our own deflection from our own sin, from our own need of judgment. And the truth is that we all need to focus more on judging ourselves and discerning those who are set against the gospel. My friend, I, I've been in these kind of situations. A couple of years ago, I went through a, a couple of situations where as I was trying to make decisions uh, in leadership, I was I was trying to follow what I really thought God was leading me to do. And I was starting to get some pushback of, of people who weren't pushing back against the actions that I were taking. It was, it was weird to me because I was receiving this pushback against the reason for my actions. No, it wasn't a, well, you're doing this and it's clearly against scripture. It was, oh no, this is just in your heart. You really want this. And I'm going, but God, in my heart, I, I've sought you through this, this decision. And I've tried to make sure that I followed your word and, why am I receiving such pushback? And God said, but how often have you done that to people? Have you not come and said, well, you know, Caleb, or you, Caleb, haven't come to somebody and said, hey, you know, the Bible says this. 
is wrong and we shouldn't be partaking in this as Christians and this is something that's in your life. No, you haven't done that. You've just said, oh, well, it's, it's their heart that's wrong. It's something inside that's going, and God smote me. It's like, Caleb, you're the judge that needs to be dealt with. Man, as I looked in the mirror and realized how often I had looked at people with that judgmentalism, with that spirit of criticism about something that I couldn't even see or know about them because it was in their heart that Jesus says only he knows. It wasn't something that I could take them to the word of God and say, here's the truth of scripture that that's just not going on. It wasn't something that I even went to them personally. I looked for other people to talk to. I, I sat and festered on it myself. And as God showed that about myself to me, it made me sick. As I realized, God, I've kicked you off of the judge's seat. I've taken that place myself. And now I'm receiving my just reward. The same judgment that I had dealt out was coming back to me. My friends, let's eradicate this spirit of judgment from our church by eradicating it from our own hearts. Oh, let's stand up and be discerning based on the truths of God's word without a doubt. Let's stand up against those who would fight and attack and, and, and divert the power of the gospel. But let's have a spirit of mercy, of meekness to restore and see disciples grow together. Would you pray with me?